Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Alexander Carpenter, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's online event, our annual Tova Yedlin Lecture at the Wirth Institute for Austrian and Central European Studies, uh, part of our Jewish Studies Week. The Tova Yedlin Lecture Series uh, is made possible by funds donated by Mrs. Deborah Yedlin and Martin Molyneux. Endowed in November of 2007, the purpose of this series is to present an annual lecture by a prominent scholar on the history of Central and East European Jewry prior to the Holocaust. Dr. Tova Yedlin was a longtime professor at the University of Alberta in what was then the Department of Slavic and East European Studies. Dr. Yedlin was born in uh, interwar Poland, a part of interwar Poland, uh, interesting for us today, which is, um, which is now a part of the Ukraine. Um, she was evacuated during the war to the Soviet Union uh, and um, immigrated to Canada after the war in 1948 and moved to Edmonton in 1950, eventually earning a PhD from the University of Alberta in 1969. And she subsequently taught at the university. Uh, she taught Russian literature and social and intellectual history until her retirement in 1996. Dr. Yedlin's principal work published in 1999 is a political biography of the Russian author Maxim Gorky. Upon retirement, she had actively engaged in building and supervising the Moshe Yedlin Memorial Library on Jewish Studies at the Beth Shalom Synagogue in Edmonton, and Dr. Yedlin passed away in 2017. The endowment that supports the Tova Yedlin Lecture Series was set up by Dr. Yedlin's daughter, Deborah Yedlin, and her husband, Martin P. Molyneux, to honor their mother's many years of service to the University of Alberta and her contributions to East European scholarship. On the advice of their mother, Mrs. Yedlin and Mr. Molyneux placed the endowment with the Wirth Institute for Austrian and Central European Studies as the scholarly unit at the University of Alberta best placed to organize and host the annual lecture. So the Tova Yedlin Lecture Series focuses on the history of Central and East Eastern, East European Jewry prior to the Holocaust, with particular emphasis on Jew-Gentile relations, primarily in the period from the 16th to the 19th centuries. And we are very fortunate and honored to have this year's Tova Yedlin lecture presented by Dr. Derek Penzler. Dr. Penzler is William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. He is also President of the American Academy for Jewish Research, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and an honorary fellow of St. Anne's College, Oxford. Uh, the author of a number of books on a range of topics, including the history of the state of Israel, and Jewish identity in modern Europe. Dr. Pendler's most recent book is a biography of Theodor Herzl, this book, um, the so-called father of political Zionism. And as Dr. Pendler notes, Herzl was a journalist, a playwright, and a political activist has been the subject of more biographies than any other political leader in Jewish history. So why then, he asks, do we need another biography? And it seems to me that Dr. Penzler's approach is, uh, is different and um, you know, a rather uniquely humanistic one, a holistic examination that situates Herzl in a bigger picture, um, rather, as he says, uh, I think starting from the foregone conclusion of um, Herzl, the great man, and instead, uh, Dr. Penzler suggests that Herzl's background in some ways made him an unlikely leader, but at the same time, his powerful energy and charisma um, helped to catalyze one of the major European political movements of the 20th century. If you have questions for Dr. Penzler, you're welcome to use Zoom's Q&A function, and we will have a Q&A session following the talk. Uh, and with that, I'm very pleased to turn the screen over to Dr. Penzler. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Alex, for the kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy, but also very honored to be giving the uh, Tova Yedlin Memorial Lecture, uh, among other things, because of um, Professor Yedlin's interest in biography. And she wrote a biography of Maxim Gorky. Uh, and I've just written a biography or recently written a biography about another literary figure, admittedly not as great a literary figure, but the literary elements of biography um, will be made uh, evident, I think, in my, in my remarks today. Because I want to begin 
by talking about how one writes a biography about any major figure, uh, particularly a literary figure. In the case of Herzl, he's a literary figure who's also a political leader, so it makes it even more complicated. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is what happens during a, a leader's own lifetime. Uh, do people write biographies or do they write something that we could call a saint's life or a hagiography um, when, when people are still bathing, as it were, in the, um, in the direct glow of, uh, of the leader's charisma? So um, first of all, the case of Herzl, he was born in 1860 in Budapest, moves to Vienna uh, as a teenager, just before he starts university, he goes to university in Vienna, uh, studies law, and then becomes a, um, he becomes a lawyer. He actually is a, is a, a, a state attorney, a Staatsanwalt for a short period of time. And then he actually becomes a professional journalist um, and playwright. And he had been doing journalistic work since his teens, uh, but he becomes a professional journalist and a very successful one. He winds up becoming the uh, Paris correspondent of the Neue Freie Presse, the most prestigious uh, newspaper in the German speaking world. And then in 1891, he's sent to Paris to be that newspaper's, um, uh, the, he's that newspaper's uh, Paris correspondent. And then only in 1895, so he's 35 years old, he has an epiphany and he becomes a Jewish nationalist. He'd never even heard the word Zionist uh, at the time of that epiphany. And for the remaining nine years of his life, he devotes all of his time that he's not spending as a journalist, he devotes his time to the development of, of the Zionist enterprise. And during those final years, because again, he's only a Zionist leader for nine years, uh, there were people who, who saw him and who knew him well and who wrote uh, biographies about him, including Reuven Brainen, who is a Eastern European Jewish uh, journalist, very prolific writer, and he actually interviewed Herzl, and Herzl gave him certain versions of his life, which then wound up becoming canonical, and they show up in one book after another about Herzl, whether or not they're actually actually true. And then there's Jacob de Haas, another one of Herzl's acolytes, who became an important figure in American Zionism, uh, founder of, among other things, the Boston Jewish Advocate newspaper. Um, and then we have a really interesting figure a, a young medic named Edwin Rosenberger, who was just a young man in his 20s in the early uh, 1900s when Herzl hired him to be one of the editors of the Zionist newspaper uh, Die Welt or, or The World. And Rosenberger wrote a wonderful account of Herzl, but it clearly is quite hagiographic. I mean, he was a very young man and he was overwhelmed by this older uh, charismatic figure. And there are times in the book where you, you almost smile um, at how wrong he gets things. So for example, as I'll talk about a little later, Herzl and his wife, Julie, had a very unhappy marriage. And there was one point where Edwin was at the Herzl home working on um, galleys of the newspaper and Julie comes over to Herzl, gives him a little, just a little kiss on the neck and says, why do people like you so much? And Rosenberger says, this is a testament to how much her, you know, Julie adored her husband. Well, actually, she was really irritated with his Zionist activity. She thought it was a huge waste of time and money. But nonetheless, these early sources are essential, just as the sources, uh, if you're writing a biography of any great figure, the people who knew that person uh, obviously have things to offer, although you have to read that work with a grain of, um, with a grain of salt. Um, and then came in the 1960s, 70s, a serious scholarship about Herzl. He had died in 1904, and time had passed, and People began to use the archival material he left behind. What's really interesting, though, is this figure on the left here, Alex Bein, who was born um, uh, in Vienna and who get, did his doctorate in Berlin. And for those of you in the field of Central European Studies, his doctoral advisor was Friedrich Meinecke, uh, a great uh, German um, uh, historian and I'd say a former political theorist. And uh, uh, Bein wrote his doctoral thesis on, of all things, Alexander Hamilton and his theory of the state. So he was interested, even before he became a Zionist um, uh, scholar, he was interested in questions of power and state building. And already in the 1930s, he wrote a very serious biography of Theodor Herzl. He wrote it in German, and then it was translated into English. And to this day, anyone interested in Herzl has to read this book. And then after him, in the 1960s and 70s, you got a, a you know, serious scholarship about Herzl. You got David Vital, who wrote a three-volume history of early Zionism. And as we recede, you know, as, as, as the past recedes into the present, uh, uh, closer to our own day, uh, we begin to deal with Herzl as a political leader, 
but perhaps without some of the um, perhaps without some of the adulation that would have come in an earlier in an earlier period. But then there comes a time in the 1970s and 80s where we entered what I call the era of deconstruction regarding Hartzell. And perhaps this is true for other great leaders, uh, great political leaders, in that there's the early generation that you know, adores him. And then you have, um, again, a period of writing serious scholarship, but one that's still very respectful. And a certain point comes where people feel that they're smothered by the political ideologies of, of, of preceding generations. They want to break away. And there came a moment in the 1970s where the Israeli journalist Amos Alon uh, wanted to deconstruct what he believed was a Herzl myth. And he wrote an extremely readable and important biography of Herzl in the mid 70s, in which we see Herzl basically presented as a deeply troubled and neurotic Central European uh, man of letters, <clears throat> a bit of a dreamer, a bit of a neurasthenic. Um, and and um, a man whose, whose flaws were at least as great as his virtues. And there were other writers like Desmond Stewart a year before who wrote in a similar vein. And then what is to this day still the best biography of Herzl by the Central European uh, writer Ernst Pavel, The Labyrinth of Exile. Again, a kind of a almost psycho almost psychobiographical, psychological deconstruction of Herzl. And as you'll see, I'm not against this in principle, I do it myself in the book, but I think it has to be combined with some other concepts. But this was the era of deconstruction in the 70s and 80s. And then um, more recently in the 21st century came uh, maybe a bit of an attempt to reclaim Herzl. So Shlomo Avineri, who um, <clears throat> is a major figure in Israeli academia, uh, he was actually a political figure. I think he was the director general of the prime minister's office back in the days of Yitzhak Rabin's first prime ministership, but a serious political scientist <clears throat> and a man who's written a number of important books. And he published a book a few years ago about Herzl that really emphasized his status as a great political thinker and leader. And again, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. The question is, how do you combine the different elements together? And I think one problem with the way Herzl has been conceived, and I'm very happy to be giving this talk within the uh, auspices of the Wirth Institute, the Wirth Institute, is the question of Herzl as maybe a Zionist writer on the one hand, and as an Austro-German writer on the other. Because a lot of people who think about Herzl think of him automatically as a Zionist. Well, remember, he, he lived to the age of 44, which is quite tragic that he died so young. He was only a Zionist activist for nine years. So the first 35 years of his life, he's having, he has nothing to do with this. So in a way, we're doing Herzl a disservice if we focus only on his Zionist writings, the most famous being his, um, his diaries. He kept diaries throughout his Zionist career, volumes two and three of the multi-volume Theodor Herzl, Brief und Tagebücher, his letters and, and diaries. Now, the, the, the letters themselves cover all sorts of issues personal as well as um, professional, but a lot of them are about Zionist activity because most of the letters are from the period after 1895. Um, so if you focus on this kind of material, you're seeing Herzl the Zionist, all the more so with his Zionist essays, his speeches, and he there's a lot of it, <clears throat> and it's very important, not to mention, let's say, his published Zionist pamphlet, the Judenstaat or the Jewish State from 1896, his programmatic essay, on what he envisioned as a solution for the problem of anti-Semitism. Obviously, anybody working on Herzl has to read his Zionist writings. The newspaper that he edited that I referred to earlier, The World or Die Welt, his great novel, Old Neuland or Old Newland, or Old Newland of 1902. It's not great in the sense of being a great piece of literature because it's, it's not. It's actually a rather mechanical and cliched piece of literature, but it's very important as a political tract for understanding Herzl's Zionist vision and what he wanted from the Zionist movement. So all of these things are you know, essential sources that throw light on Herzl as a Zionist, as is the correspondence that was written to him or about him by his Zionist colleagues. So here is a letter from Max Nordau. I'll talk more about him in a little bit. Herzl's closest colleague in the Zionist movement, Nordau was himself a great fan de siècle Central European uh, writer, playwright, and, and critic. This is a rare letter of Nordau's in English. Uh, most of his letters are in German, and they're written in the most atrocious old German handwriting, uh, but uh, they were worth the effort to decipher. 
And I mentioned that Alt Neulon, Herzl's novel, is you know a, a very important work uh, to understand Herzl's Zionist vision. But that's not that's not enough. So one of the things I really wanted to point out in my biography is the neglect in most of the work on Herzl to date of his so-called non-Zionist writings. Um, a lot of people know that Herzl was a playwright. He was, and he wasn't a very good one. Uh, he was successful. His plays were performed at the major theaters in Vienna, at Prague, uh, Berlin, even New York. Um, they were for the most part light comedies. He did um, write one very important drama that I'll talk about a little later, but that's not really where Herzl's fame lies. And reading his plays is not gonna illuminate Herzl's life very much. Herzl was a great journalist. He was truly a gifted journalist. And he had two kinds of journalism. Herzl wrote, um, uh, he wrote political journalism from Paris uh, about the political system of France. And it was marvelous. I mean, he could capture the political situation quite, quite quickly. But what I found much more interesting was Herzl wrote over 300 sort of lengthy, observational essays for the, primarily for the Neue Freie Presse from 1891 until his death. He wrote about 300 of these. And in French, they're called feuilleton. In German, actually, feuilleton. And it's, a, it's an art form that doesn't really exist in the English speaking world, but we might call it long form journalism, except it wasn't usually political. It might be a short story, it might be a series of observational essays based on a trip to a zoo or a trip to a park, or it might be just ruminations about some aspect of life. Uh, the feuilleton section still exists in, in Central European newspapers to this day. Herzl was a master of this art form of the feuilleton. He wrote beautifully and movingly. He wrote about family life. He wrote about um, social, social and cultural issues. He wrote about his children. He wrote about world politics in a kind of informal, breezy way, maybe like the talk of the town section of the New Yorker, that kind of thing, but usually much longer. And I think these writings, these feuilletons are absolutely essential to understand Herzl as a human being. Yes, he wrote them very quickly and they can be a bit formulaic, but they are very revealing of his soul, of his own sensibilities, his, his needs um, and, and his wants. Um, uh, so I think this is maybe one of the things I, I, I offer here. And that gets me to the big question, you know, what makes this biography different from all other biographies? Because I mentioned there are, are so, many, uh, so many others. Well, I've talked a little bit about method and let me show how it, how it plugs in. First, what I'm trying to do in, in, in this little biography is offer a case study of charismatic authority. Uh, Max Weber, the great German sociologist, really coined, he didn't coin the term charisma, but he, he described charisma in terms of political leadership that arises when the traditional forms of political leadership are in tatters. And then you get the, the need for the charismatic leader. Herzl fits that bill uh, perfectly. Uh, this was a time of rising anti-Semitism, persecution of Jews in Eastern Europe, violent persecution of Jews in what is today um, Crimea, Ukraine, uh, and poverty, massive poverty. And the traditional rabbinic authorities were useless in the face of this onslaught and state authority was hostile. And Herzl rose up and he was the leader who came when his people uh, needed him most. So Herzl is very much part of that um, uh, model of, of, of charismatic authority. Now, Herzl was not the only charismatic leader in the 19th century, actually, Max Nordau, sorry, uh, uh, Max Weber wrote about William Gladstone, the British liberal uh, politician of the late 19th century, mid to late 19th century, as a charismatic leader. And I think Benjamin Disraeli, uh, who was of Jewish origin himself, although converted to Christianity as a child, Disraeli was very much a charismatic leader. He was flamboyant, he was a bit outrageous, and he had tremendous appeal. He also had a lot of enemies, but the notion that a modern politician has to sort of fashion himself into a form that can reach the masses, well, Herzl is not by any means the first uh, modern politician to do that. So Herzl had a certain charismatic um, or 
grace is what the actual word charisma comes from grace. In Greek, he had a certain grace to his presence, and he was able to communicate the wants and needs of masses of Jewish people. Um, and we can even see this in how Herzl fashioned himself. Um, charismatic leaders often fashioned themselves. Disraeli thought about the way he dressed, the kind of flamboyance of his dress. Abraham Lincoln was a charismatic leader who was very well aware of how tall he was, and he would wear a tall stovepipe hat to, to accentuate that. That, that was self-fashioning. Herzl was a perfectly ordinary looking young man. If you see him in the top pictures here, he looks like he could be any one of my students. Here we see him um, probably at the time that he's an attorney in the lower left. This is a Herzl with um, long sideburns and he's probably at this time in his late twenties. And then we see Herzl here on the lower right. He's recently moved to Paris. He's working as a journalist and he wants a bit more gravitas. So he grows the full beard and we see the beginnings of what will become Theodor Herzl, the Herzl who becomes known to the public. And we see Herzl, here's about 1893, 94. Herzl, the man about town, you know, um, elegantly dressed, uh, the beard nicely, still a bit trimmed, the hair, you know, perfectly quaffed. And then we see Herzl the way he looks from 1896, 97 on, staring directly at you, his beard prematurely gray, the hair as well, staring at you with his deep seated and sad eyes. This is the Herzl who really is the, this is the appearance that Herzl, um, he cultivated it. I mean, he chose to grow the beard and he chose to grow the beard longer and longer as he, as he aged. Um, here again, we see Herzl looking very much the political leader, and you see the beard getting longer and longer. This is done intentionally. Uh, so he's fashioning himself into a great leader, and he also fashions his following. So Herzl is a charismatic leader in his looks, in his appear I mean, in his appearance, but also his voice. He evidently had a fine baritone voice. There are no recordings, unfortunately, uh, remaining of Herzl. Um, and he was considered to be quite tall. It's interesting, he was about five foot eight, uh, which doesn't sound very tall, five, but, but at, at that time that was considered a bit taller than usual. It would be like being six feet today. So he wasn't enormous, uh, but he had, he had a regal bearing. So this is one form of charisma, his voice, his appearance, and particularly his, his eyes. Anyone who met him saw in his eyes the deep sadness that seemed to represent the longings and the tragedy of the Jewish people. I mean, he simply had deep set, deep sunk eyes, but um, people read into, into his appearance what they wanted to. But Herzl was again, a playwright and he didn't only fashion his own appearance. He wanted to fashion the Jewish people. He wanted to give the Jewish people a sense of dignity and, and worth. And this is why when he convened a Zionist Congress in 1897 in the Basel Stadt Casino, so, uh, sort of a rental space for major meetings in the city of Basel, uh, he required all of the delegates uh, at the opening session of the first Zionist Congress to wear formal dress. And here we see Herzl at the podium in formal dress. Um, and here's another image of him uh, at the first Congress. You know, he wanted to convey dignity and to get a bunch of East European Jews who are perhaps not known for their formality to wear evening dress was a bit of an effort, uh, but they did so. Uh, some books about Herzl say they were uncomfortably hot, in the heat of an August, late August day, but I looked up the weather in Basel on August 26th, 1896. It was actually about, I don't know, maybe 18 degrees Celsius, uh, 20 degrees Celsius. It was quite nice. But Herzl wanted, again, to convey a sense of dignity. So he's fashioning himself, he's fashioning the Jewish people, and, and then his followers respond in kind, because this is another point about charisma. Charisma is dialogic. If you put a good-looking, charming man with leadership qualities or woman into a room and they're by themselves, they're not going to have charismatic authority, right? They have to have followers. Herzl appealed to masses of Jews. Here we see the Galician artist um, and photographer E.M. Lillian, Ephraim Moses Lillian, who was taken by Herzl and produced these famous images of Herzl as a Latter-day Moses 
or Herzl. Here we have Herzl as Moses giving the, the Decalogue. Here we have Herzl uh, angry at the Israelites and about, about to break the, the tablets of the law. And these images were widely disseminated in the Jewish world, and people were, were attracted to him. Um, here we see a an image of Herzl in, in 1903. So he hasn't died yet. So I should say myth mythologizing the hero. He's not fallen yet. This is a famous image of Herzl from Her Hermann Struck from 1903. Again, images that were widely disseminated through the world and the impact Herzl had. Uh, obviously throughout the world, people saw his image and they were attracted to his features, but people who met him in person were absolutely bowled over. There was a journalist, Nachum Sokolov, who had been suspicious of Zionism. He thought it was a bit of a, you know, a fantasy. And then he met Herzl at the first Zionist Congress, and he was completely overwhelmed. And that, that sensation is described over and over again. When Herzl walked into the um, Basel Stadt Casino to give his opening address, um, the audience went crazy. They, they applauded for 15 minutes without a stop. Women fainted. Um, men grabbed his hand and kissed his hand. A hard-bitten journalist who was suspicious of, of, of Zionism rose up and without even being in control of what he said, said, Yechia Melech, long live the king. This is the effect that Herzl had on people from a distance and from close up, um, the way he would look at people. You know, there's two kinds of charismatic leaders. There are those who make you feel like you're the most important person in the world. And there are those whom you view as the most important person in the world. And Herzl was the second kind of charismatic. Someone like Bill Clinton may have been the first kind of charismatic. So Herzl had this kind of authority. Another image that was widely spread throughout the Jewish world is Herzl as not just a leader, but a prophet, like a biblical prophet. Um, here we see L Lillian's famous photograph of Herzl overlooking the Rhine River from his hotel room at the Fifth Zionist Congress in 1901. So this was the image that Herzl gave to the world. Now, there is unfortunately another aspect of charismatic leadership that I write about in the book. Great leaders are often fragile people, um, especially charismatic ones. There's something about the energy that they generate, that they, um, uh, that they produce, uh, that is actually a kind of compensation for their own weakness, because Herzl was himself actually a very frail person. He was frail physically, as we see him here in 1903, aged, gray. This is the last picture, sorry, the last picture taken before his death, the one where he's staring at the camera blankly. I mean, he was only 44 years old when he died of heart disease. He had a most likely a congenital heart defect and he died of myocarditis. Um, he was fragile. He was fragile physically, very much like John F. Kennedy. I think they're very similar. You know, he just projected so much energy and vibrance, but actually John F. Kennedy was a very ill man. Uh, Herzl was not only ill um, physically, he was a very troubled man psychologically. Uh, he suffered from depression as an adolescent, and then he made a fateful bad decision. He married, it was the worst possible choice for him when he married Julie Noschauer. She was in her own way also a difficult person, and the two of them were like chalk and cheese. I mean, they were, they fought from the very beginning. They were sexually attracted to each other, but that wasn't really enough. Um, they kept on separating and contemplating divorce and then getting back together again for the children. They did produce three children, um, but all three of the children suffered from profound mental illness that led to their, to two of their deaths. Um, Pauline in the center uh, became a, a morphine addict. She died very young in Paris. Hans on the edge was a tragic young man who was taking, you know, well, his mother died when, 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 when she was only 39. So his, his father died, his mother died. He was raised in England. He went to Cambridge. He was a brilliant man, but he, he never found himself. And he kept converting to different religions and experimenting with different lifestyles. And he actually committed suicide on the day of Pauline's funeral. So it was very, very sad. And then the third daughter, uh, Truda or Margarita, uh, spent much of her life in mental uh, institutions. She did marry, but she was killed in, in, in Triesenstadt. She had a son before she was taken away. Uh, and he also suffered from depression and he killed himself in 1946 when he heard of his uh, family's deaths during the Holocaust. He was a British 
official stationed in Washington at the time. And when he got the news, he jumped off the, um, he was stationed in Washington. And he, he, he jumped off the Massachusetts Avenue Bridge. So it's a tragic family. It's not just physical illness, it's also mental illness. And Herzl is hardly the only great leader uh, in history to suffer from some level of mental illness. Uh, the psychiatrist Nasir Gaemi has written a very interesting book about this, about Martin Luther King's depression and suicide attempt when he was younger, Gandhi's depression and suicide attempt, Lincoln's depression, uh, Ulysses S. Grant's depression. So the fact that Herzl was himself a depressive is not unusual for great leaders, uh, nor the fact that he could be a bit manic, uh, that he could go without sleeping for long periods of time. And Herzl actually had a manic episode in 1895 that lasted about six weeks or so. And that's when he actually realized that he was a Jewish nationalist and he began writing furiously. Um, and what he wrote, some of it was just rubbish, but some of it was the essence of his political program. So Herzl had these qualities that, um, as, as Gaemi argues, great political leaders need can be a little depressed, but not too depressed, because then they can't function. Or a little manic, but not too manic, because then they also can't function. And the greatest example of this, of course, is Winston Churchill. Uh, Anthony Storr's uh, uh, classic essay on Winston Churchill's black dog, or his, that's what Herzl called his, uh, sorry, Churchill called his depression. Um, and there are times where you read quotes from Churchill and you think they could have come straight from Herzl. So Churchill, for example, once wrote, all men are worms, but I am a glow worm. That's exactly the kind of thing you would expect to have coming from Herzl. So why did Herzl turn to Zionism? Again, conventional wisdom would have it that it was anti-Semitism. Well, of course, Herzl was bothered by anti-Semitism. In 1894, he wrote a play called The New Ghetto, Das Neue Ghetto, that was all about a, a, a Jewish man modeled along his own life, struggling to deal with anti-Semitism. But the fact is most Central European Jews in the fin de siècle were exposed to anti-Semitism. They did not become Zionists. So to say that Zionism you know, is somehow directly related to anti-Semitism for Herzl, of course it's part of it. Um, there's a myth that exists to this day that I am only one of half a dozen or more people to, to dismantle that Herzl became a Zionist because of the Dreyfus affair. He didn't. He reported on the Dreyfus affair for his newspaper. His reporting on it was quite neutral. Um, the Hebrew translation of Herzl's uh, articles for the New Free Press have the anti have an anti-Semitic crowd shouting um, death to the Jews, Moro Juif, when Dreyfus was publicly degraded um, uh, at the Ecole Militaire. But this is not what the article says. It says Moro Traitre, death to the traitor, death to the Judas. I checked every French newspaper, uh, a Parisian newspaper at the time, not a single one reports the crowd saying Moro Juif. Herzl himself does not write Moro Juif. Uh, now, you might say, fine, that's public writing. Herzl, maybe secretly in his heart, was devastated by the Dreyfus affair. He doesn't mention it in any of his private writings until late 1896, by which time Herzl has been a Zionist for a year and a half. So what drove Herzl to Zionism? Um, well, anti-Semitism did matter. And part of it was this man here, Karl Weger, the mayor of Vienna from 1895, who was a Jew baiting uh, political anti-Semite. And this infuriated Herzl that his beloved Vienna uh, had succumbed to uh, the Christian social movement under Karl Lueger. But anti-Semitism doesn't explain it all. Herzl was a troubled man. He was looking for meaning in life. He was a great journalist, but did not respect journalism. He loved being a playwright, but he wasn't that good at it. He was psychologically troubled. He had an unhappy marriage. He was looking for meaning in life. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Herzl's favorite opera was Richard Wagner's Tannhäuser, about a man who was caught up in carnality. Here we see Tannhäuser in the early part of the um, opera caught up in the Venusberg, the Mount of Venus, where he's living in kind of sexual captivity to Venus. Herzl was more than a bit of a misogynist. Um, 
his writings about women are not complimentary and not flattering at all. He clearly was both attracted to and repelled by sexuality. When he's a young man, he writes to um, his closest friend about his sexual encounters, which were a bit sleazy. Um, he was very attracted to Julie, but he also found women uh, repellent. And he, he writes about this. You see it in, in his feuilletons. Um, so we see in Herzl, I think, a man who loves Tannhäuser because it's an opera about a man who's seeking to escape carnality. And who does Tannhäuser truly love? A pious virginal woman, Elizabeth, who dies. And Tannhäuser himself dies and is then redeemed. And I think for, for Herzl, Zionism was his Elizabeth. It was a way to find meaning and to project all of that anxiety and depression and to put it into something constructive, because it was quite remarkable what he did with his life. And this is what comes out from his journalistic, uh, or his, 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 his feuilletons, particularly these, the philosophic tales. Uh, you see the illustration here. This is a, a, a dirigible. Herzl was fascinated by dirigibles. Why? Because they floated and they flew, but they were also steerable. He thought of himself that way, that he was a, an artist with soaring ambitions, but he would, would be in control of his artistic productions and that he would be a great leader. So, you know, Herzl, you see a lot of Herzl's personality in these journalistic writings. Another aspect of the book is Herzl as a Zionist leader. I mean, whatever makes him become a Zionist, then the question is why he becomes a Zionist leader. Herzl does not invent the Zionist movement. It was there before him. It goes back to the early 1880s. Um, but the Zionist movement was small and in disarray, and it suffered from a serious leadership deficit. Russian Zionist leaders like Menachem Sishkin, again, a competent man with a charisma of his own, I suppose, but incapable of a broad vision, as Herzl was. Even more so, this um, figure, Asher Ginsberg, who wrote under the pen name of Ahad Ha'am, or one of the people, he was a great Hebrew essayist and a major figure who um, uh, wanted to develop a modern Hebrew culture in Eretz Israel. He had no leadership ability whatsoever, though. He was very good at criticizing other people. There was a joke about Ahad Ha'am that if he saw Achilles, he would only notice his heel. So he had no leadership ability to speak of. And then there's Natan Birnbaum, who actually introduced Herzl to the world of Zionists in Vienna in 1895-96. Birnbaum himself would have loved to be a great Zionist leader. He even had the beard, but he did not have charisma. He did not have really much leadership ability. And he left the Zionist movement altogether, eventually became an ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionist. Herzl was a rare breed. He was inspiring. He was charismatic. He was willing to work 24 hours a day. He worked full-time as an as a, um, editor at his newspaper and as a writer of Feuilleton. Then he also was constantly traveling around Europe for Zionist affairs. He was indefatigable. It's one of the things that killed him. Uh, so, so he was charismatic. He had a work ethic. And he also was a good organizer. Herzl was very good at getting things done. He founded the Zionist organization. He founded the Zionist bank. He, he, he organized the Zionist congresses. He had a variety of leadership abilities that these men didn't have, nor did this man. I, I referred earlier to Max Nordau, perhaps the most famous European figure in the Zionist movement in the um, early 1900s. Nordau was a great figure. Um, and he was a close supporter of Herzl's, but he never did anything. I mean, he would come before the Zionist Congress and give great speeches, and he would write articles for the Jewish press, but he, he never organized anything. He never traveled around the world trying to gain international approval uh, for Zionism. He was a very happily married man. He married a Danish woman much younger than him, a Gentile woman, and uh, he simply led a happy life, whereas the unhappy Herzl was a great leader. Um, the last issue I want to talk about then is how we combine Herzl the Zionist, Herzl the Austro-German journalist, and Herzl the man. And that is Herzl's ventures in the world. Herzl 
believed that the Jewish people needed a homeland, most likely in, in Palestine. And he believed that he had to get permission from the international community for this venture. Perhaps from the Ottoman Empire itself, and he met several times with the Ottoman Emperor fruitlessly, or perhaps from a great power like um, the United Kingdom or Germany. And Herzl himself loved playing the role of statesman. So here we see Herzl in Palestine in 1898 wearing colonial garb. Um, he, he, he loved this aspect of the job. Uh, here we see Herzl, this is a postcard he sent to his um, daughter uh, from Jerusalem in 1898 when uh, Kaiser Wilhelm actually visited Palestine. That's the only reason why Herzl went to Palestine was to meet the Kaiser just outside of Damascus Gate uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, Herzl was absolutely smitten by the Kaiser. Uh, he, he thought they were pals. He, he writes about the Kaiser in the most amazing language in his diaries and his private writings. He never really got over the fact that the Kaiser eventually dismissed Zionism as impracticable because the Ottoman Sultan would never allow it. Herzl continued to dream about the Kaiser. I mean, there was something very interesting going on there. Here we see Herzl and uh, his um, um, colleagues about to go and meet the Kaiser in October of 1898. The temperature was in the mid to high 30s that day. Uh, they were sweating profusely, but there you see them, you know, all dressed up. Um, this was an aspect of the job that Herzl loved. And Herzl, the journalist, was also very interested in um, sort of the realm of the colonial and of great power interest and influence in the Middle East. He wrote about the British in Egypt, for example, and he wrote a series of essays about phenomena in fin de siècle Europe known as um, Menschengarten or Zoumen or human zoos, where peoples from Africa or from the South Pacific or from um, uh, uh, Native Americans from North America would essentially be displayed in um, public fora. And Herzl wrote about these, um, these, um, these displays in a positive manner as educational. And, and, he, and he, he, was no, uh, he was not an opponent of colonialism. He believed that the Western powers had a civilizing mission. Uh, it was a liberal colonialism, but it was colonialism nonetheless. And we see all of this in his novel, Old New Land, that I referred to as so important, not because it's a great novel, but we see his vision of a future Jewish homeland, which is not really a state. It has no clear borders. It has no army. The Arabs are fully included in this new society. Um, so it's not colonialist in the sense of being oppressive. And there's a point where he brings into the novel a physician who is working to cure various tropical diseases, including malaria, so that black Americans can, if they wish, go back to Africa. So it's a kind of a reformist vision of people returning to their ancestral home, Jews to Eretz Israel, American, the descendants of American slaves back to Africa, all done under the beneficence of Western science. And as he wrote about the British, also Western colonial tutelage, he thought it was a good thing that the British were occupying Egypt. He thought they could teach the Egyptians, you know, so it's a very paternalistic kind of colonialism, but we see in all Old New Land where his vision ultimately lies, which is in um, uh, really the restoration of people. And Herzl did write at the time that he was in Egypt in 1902, when he met a bunch of young Egyptians attending a talk, uh, attending a lecture, he wrote, these young men might represent the end of British rule in Egypt someday. He was not ignorant of anti-colonialism. So his views about colonialism were complicated. They, they affected his Zionist activity. They affected his non-Zionist writings and his own desire to be a man of power, a man of influence. I mean, Hertz got to meet the Kaiser. He got to meet the Pope, the King of Bulgaria. He had meetings with the Russian interior minister and finance minister. He had meetings with the British colonial and foreign secretaries. Herzl loved this. It made him feel very special and he was very special. So in conclusion, I'll talk just a little bit about the myth of Herzl after he died. More than 40 years after he died, the state of Israel was created and Herzl was disinterred from Vienna and his remains were brought to Jerusalem where they were buried with great 
ceremony on what became known as Har Herzl, Mount Herzl. And the myth of Herzl as envisioning a Jewish state with a powerful army um, at that time, its leading sector being communal, communal agricultural settlements, things that Herzl himself would never really have probably fully understood. Uh, Herzl becomes kind of a, a symbol for everything that the state of Israel wants to uh, believe that it is. And I don't have time to show this um, now. Um, I'll just show a very brief section if I can get it to work. This is a film from 1921. Uh, mythologizing Herzl. I just want to show how they present Herzl's turn to Zionism. So this is Herzl. So sorry, this is now Moses. And there's Herzl. So you see the, the, the chain of transmission of culture. Moses the prophet speaks to Herzl the prophet, tells Herzl to lead his people, right, into um, redemption. So this is how Herzl becomes a Zionist, according to this movie. And then according to the film, just a moment, sorry. According to the film, then we have Herzl convening the Zionist Congress, leading the Jewish people. Of course, they adore him. And then he begins his great epic journeys abroad to win support for the Zionist cause. Whoops. But what's interesting is, sorry about that. What's interesting is how they represent his meetings with world leaders. So here he is meeting the Ottoman Sultan. So Herzl asks for help. There's a lot of bowing, a lot of orientalistic bowing. More bowing. And then finally, okay, more bowing. Um, this is not true. <laughs> you know, the Ottoman Sultan made very clear to Herzl that he was not going to help the Zionist enterprise. And people watching the film must have known this because it was a historic fact. Similarly, in the film, Herzl meets the Pope. And the Pope gives Zionism his blessing. The Pope did the exact opposite. But this is how Herzl was mythologized after his death. So here we see even Herzl as a kind of kitsch figure. This is an unknown American artist. We see Herzl in the foreground. We see fields with Jews laboring in the fields in the background. And for good measure, a menorah um, next to Herzl. It got to the point that Herzl's memory became so, or the mythologization became so grand that in 1947, uh, the radio program, The Eternal Light, broadcast a program in which Herzl is represented, first of all, as being like seven feet tall, and that he saves the life of a, an impoverished minstrel by taking an accordion, putting on the minstrel's clothes, how he could do that if he was seven feet tall, I don't know, playing in the town square and getting tons of money from well-wishers. And then Herzl comes back to the, the poor minstrel's home and gives him all the money. And then the minstrel is able to pay off his debts. I mean, this kind of folklore about Herzl became very common in the decades after his death. And then Herzl in more recent years has definitely been deconstructed. So I'm gonna play you just one minute of a video from the early 2000s from an Israeli hip hop group in which um, characters from a 1970s era Israeli educational TV program go back to Basel. Now it's in Hebrew, but you're going to get, if you don't know Hebrew, you're going to get what's going on. Uh, believe me, I'll just play one minute of this. I just have to go to, to just a moment. Sorry, just one, there we go. So they're going back to Basel and they're going to visit Herzl. And they're telling Herzl, they want to complain to Herzl about how bad things are in Israel today. And they go back to Basel and they look into those deep set eyes of his and they find he is stoned. 
They're telling about all the bad things going on in Israel. They're telling him there's no peace. There's constant conflict. So Herzl says to them, if you take it, meaning if you take a couple of LSD tablets, it is no dream. In Hebrew, im tirtsu, enzo agada, if you wish it, it is no dream. So it's a pun on Herzl, the great visionary. Now he's simply a drugged out, you know, loser filled with dreams that did not come true because the state of Israel is not what Herzl envisioned it to be. So this is a kind of a satirical and rather dark um, example of the deconstruction of the Herzl myth in the 21st century. Um, so, you know, Vanya Vodic's Kainmärchen is what Herzl himself wrote in Alt Neuland, if you wish it, it is no dream, but I'd say for a number of um, representations of Herzl in the 21st century, Ben Ilvot ist des Einmärchen, it is a fairy tale. And here we see, I finish with an image of Herzl as a hipster, uh, which has been circulating on the internet for the last few years. So with that, I'll stop and uh, I look forward to your questions and your comments. Well, thank you so much, Professor. I'll, I'll jump back in. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, I, if you don't mind, well, I'll, I'll do what we so often do as academics. I will, as the, as the moderator, I will uh, enjoy the privilege of asking a, a question or two first, if you, sure. if you don't mind. Um, and I'll try not to, uh, as per our discussion just before the session, I'll try not to make them uh, comments, but... Um, uh -huh. Two things, two things that struck me that I hope you would res respond to, and one is um, because my own area of interest is uh, turn of the century Vienna musical, musical mm -hmm. culture, but uh, cultural history and um, intellectual history. Around this very same time, it seems to me as you were as you were um, describing Herzl, um, you know, he's he's very much uh, you you want to. You want to talk about him and situate him in your bio uh, your biography on the one hand as a uh, you know he is a, a unique and kind of standalone figure, but in other ways he seems so strikingly like some of his contemporaries. Mm -hmm. I mean this idea of of charismatic authority of of self fashioning of fashioning his own followers. Um, you could be talking about Freud uh, mm -hmm. in some ways, and uh, my my own area of interest is, uh, the, is the music of Arnold Schoenberg and the people who surrounded Schoenberg. And um, Schoenberg and Freud were also kind of hung up on Moses in their own, uh -huh. in their own ways. I wonder yeah. if, if you could sort of talk about Herzl in, in that context, that he's in some ways kind of a, uh, a Viennese of, of, of his time and of that moment in that way. Oh, he's very much of that moment. I mean, think about I don't remember who it is, if it's Richie Robinson has an article at Herzl where there's a bunch of Venn diagrams where you see Herzl and all the famous fin de siècle sure. sort of Viennese people he hung out with. He was actually a very good friend, on very good, uh, uh, fr he had a very strong friendship with Arthur Schnitzler. Mm -hmm. And they were very close for a while, but frankly, the friendship cooled because Herzl was jealous. Herzl knew that Schnitzler was a much better writer than he was. And uh, it really drove Herzl crazy. He had a lot of envy. And that's why he didn't like being a literary editor at the Neue Freie Presse, because he had to edit the work of people who were better writers than him, who were more right. talented than him. But he, um, he was also friendly with Hugo von Hofmannsthal. Mm -hmm. And there's some time when they're in their mid-30s, they all go off on a holiday. They go off to Alsay together. You know, they, they, they take a summer holiday. It's Hofmannsthal, Schnitzler, Herzl. So it's kind of a rogues gallery, right? Um, and, you know, you mentioned Freud and Schoenberg. It's a funny thing about Freud. Herzl and Freud never met. They lived six blocks from each other, but they never met. They wrote letters to each other. Um, and I think Freud sent Herzl a copy of The Interpretation of Dreams. I'm trying to remember which, which, which book it was. And Freud dreamed about Herzl. That's it. He did send Herzl one of his books, but Freud dreamed about Herzl, the famous My Son, the Myope dream, where... Um, Freud writes about the, about the dream. He writes, you know, I'd been at the Berg Theater and saw this play by this man Herzl. And then he has a dream 
where he hears the 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 the, the, the words gazerus gazerus i think which is yiddish for um like an evil decree or something and freud writes my friends who know yiddish tell me it means this as if as if freud didn't know yiddish um but i wonder if there's something about and I hadn't thought about this, not just the nature of, you know, his neuroses or his literary influences, but the nature of the relationship between disciples and authority figures, acolytes, right, and charismatic figures um, in an era. And also the, um, what's the word, um, homocentrism or something. I mean, it's a very male-centered world. It has monastic qualities. Um, and I'm wondering if that's part of the picture rather than, rather than just the content. Because I would imagine that the kind of things that Schoenberg is an acolyte. Actually, one of my students compared it a little bit to Mahler as well. So, um, yeah, it's fascinating. Well, yeah, it's an amazingly incestuous little community in some ways. But, yeah. I mean, you mentioned Schnitzler. You know, there's this, um, I don't know what you'd say, like a catalyzing tension. That there is all of this overlap that you could certainly, you can map it out in Venn diagrams. But there's also this, uh, you know, real sort of... Um, pushing away, you know, that, that people are in contact or they should reasonably be in contact with each other. And yet there's also um, th this, um, whether it's professional jealousy or a fear of kind of being, you know, being tainted by somebody else's yeah. work or whatever. I'll, 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 I won't hold you too long uh, so we can get to the Q&A. But the other thing I, I just wanted to ask about in a very general way, um, as a historian, it seems to me um, the work that you're doing, it points to two things that I think are really one of the most um, interesting things about doing this kind of historical work. Um, uh, one, and I think, I'm not sure if, if you talked about it today, but the sort of the, the possibility, the, the tantalizing possibility of, of uh, counterfactuals, right? Mm -hmm. So Herzl had, he had some of these, these very um, uh, powerful and important qualities and had also some qualities that, you know, he, he, he may well have, um, in another context, have undermined um, his own ability to become who he, who he became, or circumstances might not have favored him. So this, I'm asking, I guess, about the, the, the contemplation of counterfactuals, which is very interesting, but also this tension that you talked about quite a bit, or this, how, how you balance demythologizing um, with, um, you know that you don't necessarily want to destroy or do violence to the to the historical figure you're engaging with, and and right. that there is always some kind of um, even if Herzl is not seven feet tall, um, there is there is some sort of kernel of uh, you know important truth to get at there that people um, um, perceive him that way. So I wonder. I guess I'm asking you about the, the tension, the balancing between the demythologizing that's probably right. that's an inevitable part of the rigor of of writing history, but also um, some some reverence, as you said at the beginning, or some respect for this figure. Absolutely, and um, well, I'm I'm I have no problem with counterfactual history. Uh, one of the best practitioners of it actually used to teach here. Neil Ferguson wrote a book called Virtual History about this, and I've written I I, I wrote an essay on counterfactual Zionist history. It's the only thing I've ever written that got reviewed in a science fiction magazine, so I was very proud of that. Um, and, you know, we, we, we call it by a different word. Uh, we call it contingency. Uh, you know, what if, what if Herzl had had a happy marriage? What if he had a, he wouldn't have become a, a Zionist leader, most likely. Uh, does that mean there wouldn't have been a Zionist movement? Well, I think there still would have been because um, it was limping along before Herzl. And the person who really propelled Zionism from even what Herzl created into, you know, what became a kind of critical mass entity was Chaim Weizmann during the interwar period. He did have charisma. He had organizational ability. He was a much better, frankly, negotiator. And it was a different time when the Ottoman Empire had fallen apart and Britain was you know, in control of so much of the Middle East. So I think Zionism would have developed anyway if it hadn't been for Herzl. But obviously, the, what Weizmann couldn't communicate was gravitas, dignity. He didn't have Herzl's looks. And looks matters. I mean, Herzl's image mattered a lot to people. So clearly, his presence added a great deal. Um, the other question, I mean, this is exactly what I tried to get at in the book, is that I think we live in an era now that is much more sympathetic and kind to mental illness. We understand that psychological <clears throat> complexity is the human condition, just like physical, you know, frailties. 
And, um, you know, today if Herzl walked into a psychologist's office or psychiatrist's office, he would be diagnosed and given some medication and, and, and you know, it wouldn't be that big a deal. This was a different era where what we today would call mental, mental illness might've been called eccentricity. And I've come across this in writings about other people like the Russian author, um, Jewish author, Yosef Chaim Brenner, who was, I mean, much more depressive than Herzl and would do things like walk into a friend's home in, in, in Jaffa, throw himself on the floor, scream and yell uncontrollably, bang his head on the floor and then leave. And people would just say, oh, there goes Yossi. I mean, in other words, it was much, much more forgiving. And then we've entered the era of medicalization uh, and stigmatization of the mentally ill. And, and, and mentally Ill. Now I think we're, we're getting out of that. What makes Herzl so interesting to me is precisely that he did struggle so much, that he was so troubled. And, and you know, how do people respond to that kind of crisis? They could give up. They could kill themselves. Herzl never, as far as I know, right? The sources only tell you so much. I, I don't think he ever, he wrote about suicide. He never tried. He was invested in life. There's a moment, I forget when it is in the 80s, he's writing to his parents and he says there's a kind of calmness and an investment in life that has come over him despite all of his problems. And that's what interests me. So it's not about deconstructing, you know, Herzl as a great figure. He was a great figure, but he wasn't a two-dimensional mythological figure. And I think now we're probably more willing to engage with that conversation. I've noticed I've gotten very little pushback from readers, including, you know, staunchly Zionist readers, for my depiction of Herzl, because it is respectful. Uh, he was a fascinating man and a great leader, but he was a bit odd. You know? <laughs> you know? Well, thank you. Um, thanks for that. I'm going to jump into the Q&A if, uh, yeah. yeah. if you don't mind. And um, I see a work. Um, uh, the, first, the first question is actually from Mr. Alfred Wirth, who is uh, the namesake of the oh, Institute. Very nice. Um, and uh, he writes that um, Herzl met and enjoyed meeting leaders like uh, Wilhelm II. Uh, it was quite possible to meet Franz Josef in Vienna since he saw um, the citizens of the city for half an hour every day um, at the Hofburg. So the question is, did Herzl meet Franz Josef? Yeah. He never met him. I don't know if he ever saw him, but Herzl was on very close terms with not one, but two Austrian ministers president. Um, Oh, Kerner was the one, and I'm blanking on the name of the other. And because think about this, Herzl is the most highly paid, most best known journalist uh, in Vienna's and really you know, German speaking Europe's most prominent newspaper. So obviously the equivalent of the prime minister for the Austrian half of the empire, they want, they want this guy on their side. So they invite him over, they give him meals, you know, they talk. And Herzl did things for them. Uh, for example, there was once, I think it was Kerner was writing a speech on the language issue and he wanted Herzl to write a speech for him, which Herzl did. And then the prime minister wound up using like one line from it, which really upset Herzl. But there's even a moment when Herzl, like he would go to the prime minister's house at night, his private residence at night at 9.30 at night. And, and the prime minister would be there in his, you know, in his, um, what do you call it? In the, not smoking jacket, in his... Uh, not pajamas, but sort of, you know, casual dress. So they were uh, on very informal terms. Uh, so Herzl did, he did rub shoulders with, uh, he also knew evidently, he was on very good terms with um, Clemenceau in Paris. Clemenceau thought very highly of him. And he met Marcel Proust. I don't know what they thought of each other. And ironically, Herzl was on very good terms with Alphonse Daudet, the French writer who was himself an anti-Semite but thought it was really cool to invite Herzl to his soirees because look, I have a Jew, you know, that kind of exotic Jew. So yeah, Herzl hung out with the high and mighty. Very cool. Um, <laughs> there is a question um, uh, asking you to comment on Herzl as a Jew and not uh, a Zionist and his practice, if any, as a Jewish person. Again, this is where there's these two kind of hot front, cold fronts and where I stand in the middle. You know, the cold front is that Herzl was totally assimilated. So I'll give you that side. Um, he wasn't raised in an observant house. Um, he celebrated Christmas until the, around 1897 or so. He did not circumcise his son or have his son Hans circumcised. 
he wasn't observant in any conventional sense. However, Herzl's grandfather was extremely orthodox and had studied, uh, Herzl's grandfather was from what is today a suburb of Sarajevo, and uh, sorry, a suburb of Belgrade. Um, and um, uh, he had studied, his grandfather had actually studied with an early proto-Zionist Orthodox rabbi. And Herzl may very well have heard about this when he was young because the grandfather would come once a year and spend a couple of weeks at the house. And the grandfather kept kosher and they provided kosher food. Herzl writes casually about going to the synagogue as a child, the Tabakstrasse synagogue with his father. How often, whatever. He went to a Jewish day school. Now, did he learn anything? Well, who learns, who learns anything in Jewish day school? But he, he went and uh, he didn't have a bar mitzvah, maybe because there was a cholera epidemic at the time. He had a kind of home confirmation, but he writes about getting bar mitzvah gifts. When he went through his phase of Jewish reawakening, he was in Paris. He went to the Rue de la Victoire Synagogue. He had an aliyah on the Shabbat before the first Zionist Congress. Um, also, how can you live in Vienna in, you know, in the 1890s and not be aware of your Jewishness? So, and, and he definitely became more ethnically and even slightly religiously Jewish as he got older. He, he, he instructed his children to say Hebrew prayers in the late 1890s. Uh, he didn't know Hebrew himself, uh, but there's something going on. And he wrote really a beautiful essay around 1901, 1902 on the Sabbath, where he writes that Zionism was the Sabbath of my life. Now, Zionism is all about action. It's not about resting, which is what the Sabbath is, which tells you about his ignorance of Judaism. But he used the metaphor. Um, now, I do think there's something very wrong with a school of neo, very right-wing religious neo-Zionism, which depicts Herzl as a great religious Jewish figure. There's a person in Israel who's written a book about this, which I think is just not true. Um, Herzl, when he wrote about Judentum, which he wrote a lot, well, Judentum can mean two different things. It can mean Judaism, but it can also mean the Jews as a collective. And I'm positive he really is writing about it as Judentum as a collective. So yes, he, he engages with religion more as he gets older, but he never really becomes an observant Jew. Um, so yeah, like everything else about Herzl, it's complicated. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, um, two, two other questions um, for you. The first is, did Herzl really say Palestine was a land without a people for a people without a land? And did he believe that, particularly the first part? Uh, he never said that, actually. That saying was coined, I believe it was, um, was it the Shaftesbury in the early 19th century? It was an English Gentile politician who actually said it first. I believe that Israel Zangwill, who was a Zionist for a while and then became a territorialist looking for a Jewish territory outside of Eretz Israel, I think he may have said it. Herzl never said it. Herzl certainly knew there were Arabs in Palestine. He just didn't care very much. I mean, it's very simple. Before he went to Palestine, you know, he never even thought about it. But then he got to Palestine. And, you know, he notices there's Arabs and he writes, he mentions it very briefly in his diaries. Um, and he writes about Arabs occasionally in a paternalistic, positive way. He writes that when I have the power, I will think of the fellahim. I will, you know, benefit them. Um, he writes about them at times in a disparaging way. And then you have his novel, Old New Land, where one of the major characters is an Arab who is, again, a model of Western... He's been westernized. He got his education in Aachen, I think. He has a northern German accent. Um, and yet, you know, and Arabs are fully integrated into what Herzl calls the new society. But And this man is also observant. And his wife is evidently observant. We never meet, we never meet the wife. So Herzl's views about Arabs are complicated. A lot of people focus on a very brief diary entry Herzl wrote in June of 1895 when he was going through a manic fit. And he writes we shall evacuate the impoverished native population from our future land. So it's one sentence. And a lot of people say, okay, so Herzl wanted to expel all the Palestinians from Palestine. Well, if you read that section in the context, I mean, he was crazy. He was saying all kinds of crazy things at the time. So, you know, there are people who say, no, Herzl was always harboring it and he just wasn't saying it. And look, I, 
I argue from the evidence that I have, and the evidence is, suggests that Hertz's views were paternalistic, and I can understand why people would be upset with that, but that he never envisioned Palestine as um, you know, an empty country. At least that much he knew better. I guess there's, there's two, more, two more questions, um, but, but I think keeping, keeping uh, along the same line, um, the, que the question is, if Herzl were alive now, what do you imagine he would say? about the state of Israel as, as it is today? Gottes willen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just a yeah, little, a little yeah. throwaway question. I mean, no, I just think, um, can you imagine anyone, Schnitzler, Freud, Schoenberg, anybody from that era alive today, would they even be able to comprehend it? I don't know. In some ways, Herzl would understand the world we lived in. You know, not only did Herzl, Herzl predicted the internet, it's one of these throwaway lines in Altneuland. He refers to the electronic newspaper that people read every day. So maybe that would, he predicted interstate highways. He wrote, he, write, he writes about that. Uh, he predicted air conditioning. I mean, so maybe a lot of our technology he'd be quite familiar with and he would be impressed by. I think he'd be very impressed by Israel's material accomplishments, its economic accomplishments, the startup nation, you know, the high technology and all of that. He'd be very impressed with the immigration the success of immigration, the cities, the farms, you know, I mean, the Hebrew culture would fascinate him. He wasn't an enemy of Hebrew. He didn't understand it, but he respected it. You know, he always had a Hebrew amanuensis and he always had someone to translate his works into Hebrew. He respected it. So I think there's a lot of things about Israel he would like, but there's other things that would just dumbfound him. I mean, Herzl was a big believer that the army will stay in its barracks and the rabbis will stay in their synagogues. So he would have been very disturbed by Israel's theocratic qualities, very disturbed by the role of the rabbinate, very disturbed by the political power of the Orthodox. And he would have been, I think, in despair over the conflict, the ongoing conflict between Israel and so much of the Arab world and, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think that this would have um, simply been a violation of everything he believed or hoped, I should say would have happened. Last but not least, Herzl was confident that a Jewish state would put an end to anti-Semitism throughout the world because it would give Jews a sense of dignity and Gentiles could say that Jews are now a normal people. They have a state just like everybody else. But you know that hasn't happened. And the fact that anti-Semitism is, is such a danger in the world today is something that would have made Herzl heart sick. And I'll just finish with reference to a, a play that was produced in Israel three years ago about Herzl coming back from the dead. Um, in contemporary Israel. And he looks around and it's not what he expects. And um, actually it's not contemporary Israel, it's in Israel of the 1950s, that's it. And so David Ben-Gurion actually tells the people who found him to like kill him again and put him back in his coffin because you know, they don't want Herzl talking about what the state of Israel should be. Um, so I think that the, you know, a lot of things about contemporary Israel, Herzl would be you know, thrilled at, but um, there's some very big things that would sorely disappoint him. No doubt. Um, think, thinking about, uh, we're talking about anti-Semitism, um, but sh shifting, shifting backwards, uh, looking back into history, there's a question about what was driving anti-Semitism in Vienna around that, uh, around that period. So I guess the sort of the Karl Lueger mayorship um, around that period. And then I'm not sure if this relates in a way, but um, there's a question too about Herzl and Kafka being engaged in the search for the new Jew at a time when European Jews were beginning to understand that they were at a dead end. I don't know if those two things uh, relate in some way, but. Well, I mean, anti-Semitism, look, if you're a member of an ethno-racial minority and you're at the, you know, at, you're, you're the victim of some kind of persecution or oppression, how do you respond? One is to reject it altogether. One is to simply ignore it. One is to internalize it. And there is something to Herzl internalizing anti-Semitism as so, so many Jews in the fin de siècle did. Maybe there's something wrong with, it, with, with Jews. Maybe too many of us are in, engaged in uh, the stock market. Maybe we should, um, and I'm thinking of another messed up young Jew, Otto Weininger, who wrote a um, really tragic, uh, deeply worrisome essay, it was a Geschlecht und Charakter, uh, about basically that whatever the anti-Semites say is wrong with the Jews is, is true, and that 
they're effeminate and they're irrational. Um, the great German industrialist Walter Rathenau in 1896, the same year as Herzl's Der Judenstaat, wrote an essay called Höre Israel, Hero Israel, which is really a catalog of, yes, we Jews are not physically fit, we're not sufficiently um, economically productive, we're vulgar, we're too loud. I mean, it's like he's accepted all of these anti-Semitic stereotypes. It's painful to read. And Herzl certainly did some of that. And after all, what did the Zionists wanted to do? They wanted to prove to the world that Jews can farm, that Jews can work, that Jews can fight. And yes, they were going to do it in, in order to emancipate themselves and create a Jewish homeland. But there is no small amount of the internalization of anti-Semitism in the concept of the new Jew. Um, Kafka is a little bit more complicated. I do know that Kafka wrote about this a bit. I remember he 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 knew a bit of Hebrew. He learned some Hebrew, right? He knew the Hebrew word for squirrel. I remember seeing an illustration where he has, he didn't learn Hebrew cursive, but he could do Hebrew block letters. He writes snai, a little drawing of a squirrel. So, okay. Um, no, but I think that anti-Semitism plays directly in, into the concept of the new Jew. Um, and then anti-Semitism at the fin de siècle is simply, uh, was it Carl August Babel, the German socialist who wrote that anti-Semitism is the socialism of stupid people? That when you are trying to understand the rapid urbanization, industrialization, class distinctions, just the general misery of the working classes, you're trying to understand how the older middle class is being undermined by the rise, say, of department stores or railroads that make it possible to bring in you know, uh, uh, goods from far away at, at a much lower price, let's say, than when they were, then, then, then you could you know, get them locally. Uh, the decline of small shopkeepers who were done in by larger enterprises. And a lot of the department stores in Germany and Austria were founded by Jews. Um, when you lose your money in the stock market crash, uh, stock market crash of 1873, or you're suffering from inflation in the 1880s, sorry, deflation in the 1880s, 1890s, um, you know, you need to blame someone. And even more than that economic side of it was the cultural side of it. The world was changing. I mean, the world that, you know, that Alex, that you write about, that cultural innovation, we today, you know, us academics, we see it as a wonderful thing. Schnitzler, well, Schnitzler's plays were considered pornographic at the time. Freud, his work was considered outrageous. And people thought this was degenerate. And even Max Nordau, who is himself Jewish, wrote a scathing volume called Entartung, or Degeneration, about a variety of cultural trends, which he attributed largely to non-Jews, like Henrik Ibsen or to um, Friedrich Nietzsche. But a lot of people said, you know, blame it on the Jews, that they're agents of change, of noxious, unwelcome change, that they seek to undermine society from, from the bottom up. And this was a very popular form of political discourse. In, in Vienna. And when you combine that with this charismatic politician, Karl Lueger, who bears a striking similarity to Seth Rogen, so we know who can play him in the film, um, you had the recipe for a successful political anti-Semitic movement. So, and, for, and of course, Herzl is, is caught up in it. Thank you for that. Um, let's, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up with, uh, there's a rather, rather nice uh, sort of I think philosophical question or comment. Um, as Shabbat is a day of refraining from all matters of physical work, Zionism uh, as the Shabbat of his life can include his depth of devotion to thinking about, um, to thinking about as you're allowed on Shabbat and meditating on Zionism uh, as in the light of Shabbat. Hmm. Uh, is this a possibility? Is the, it is a possibility, uh, yeah. but not for Herzl. Okay. See, the interesting thing about Herzl is, and this is one of the other, hopefully, Hidushim in the, uh, innovations in my biography. He was not a great thinker. He wasn't. He was a great leader. He was a great journalist. He was a great communicator. He actually didn't write that much that was, you know, systematic or whatever. And what did Herzl do on his Saturdays to be much more practical? He was usually on a train. He was going to Paris to meet with the Rothschilds. He was going to Berlin to address a Zionist meeting. He was, you know, on a ship going to um, Istanbul. There's even a funny story about Herzl arriving in Jerusalem. He'd been in Jaffa, and it's a Friday, and they're, they need to get to Jerusalem. And they want to get to Jerusalem before Shabbat starts. 
but there's some breakdown in the coach and they get to Jerusalem after Shabbat starts and they're a few miles from the hotel. Herzl, meanwhile, has, has fallen ill. Herzl had periodic fevers. People don't know if he contracted malaria on top of everything else as a young man in Southern France. There's even a theory he may have had lupus, nobody knows. Anyway, so he's got a high fever. He feels awful and it's Shabbat. He wants to take a cab to the hotel, okay? But he's with his fellow Jews are more observant and they insist that they walk. And Herzl writes how miserable he was walking. So I found some account of that years later in a newspaper, a Jewish newspaper that says, despite being ill, Herzl insisted on walking. No, he wanted to take a cab, it's in his diary. Okay, so no, he was, he, he was not Shomer Shabbos. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for the, for the talk uh, and, and for the, your generosity with answering the, the questions. Um, it's complicated, as you say, um, but um, I, we're grateful to you for, for making it so engaging and, uh, and so accessible. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, and for anyone who would rather read it in German, I'm very excited. The German translation was published yesterday. Ah, congratulations. By much, Dr. Lag. And they did a really nice job. My German daughter-in-law even gave it her seal of approval. She said ah. that the German is very good. Okay. She didn't say it was better than my English or worse than my English. I'll just leave that aside. All right. Well, we have a German <laughs> constituency. I'm sure they would be. Okay. By Stein Verlag. There you go. Okay. Uh, on, well, then... I'll say formally on, on, well, on behalf of myself, on behalf of the Worth Institute, um, thank you very much for delivering this year's Tova Yedlin lecture. We are most grateful. And that, okay. that brings us to the, to the end. Okay, thank you, Alex. Thank you everyone for your participation, attendance, and especially for your questions.